Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Patrick Blades. I'm the Housing Associate at Building Community Workshop. Uh, and we're the uh, organization that's putting on this event, and I'll get to what BC Workshop is here in a second. Uh, but first again, thank you for, uh, for attending the event, uh, especially during the holiday season, where there are other events like city manager meetings and holiday in the parks and so many other things that are going on. Uh, also, thank you to UNT for hosting us. Uh, I don't know about anybody here, but uh, for how many of you guys, how many is it your first time in this building? Yeah, pre pretty much most of us. So, uh, at least a good portion of us. I, I think it's a, UNT's done a great job of being able to reuse and um, uh, preserve the, uh, the Otitis building here. So, again, thank you to them. Uh, a quick rundown of what we're going to be doing tonight. <clears throat> we're going to start off with a presentation. Uh, it'll be about 15 minutes. Uh, I will start giving the presentation. Uh, then my colleague uh, Owen Wilson Chavez from BC Workshop uh, will continue, and then uh, our former colleague Thomas Simpson uh, will end it up. It'll be about 15 minutes. Uh, from then, we'll move on to the panel discussion for about 30 minutes of uh, uh, the discussion there. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll wrap up with questions. So if you have any questions about the presentation, you can ask them at that point or for the room at, um, at that time. So again, uh, we, uh, we're here with the Building Community Workshop. Uh, BC Workshop, or BC, is a Texas-based nonprofit community design center that seeks to improve the livability and viability of those that we work with uh, through thoughtful placemaking and design. Uh, we have offices here in Dallas, also in Houston, in Brownsville, and out in DC. Uh, we, are, we deal with a lot of housing, planning, and architectural work. Uh, here in Dallas, some of the work that you may be uh, familiar with is we did the, uh, the cottages over at MLK, the permanent supportive housing over there. Uh, we've also developed uh, affordable housing on Congo Street in South Dallas. We've uh, helped facilitate the design of more than two dozen little free libraries and asset poor areas here in the community. Uh, we've done a lot of community engagement. Uh, we're working on the uh, Smart Growth for Dallas program. I'm, uh, hopefully some of you guys are aware of that, uh, dealing with how we're going to utilize our parks and better develop our parks here in the future. Um, and again, BC Workshop is the organization uh, that has released the report of affordable housing, transporting development, uh, assessing dark-owned surface parking lots surrounding their rail stations uh, as a catalyst for affordable housing. So the program that uh, released the report with BC is uh, Aim for Dallas, and Aim for Dallas is a program that promotes innovative and new solutions, programs, and concepts for housing affordability here in the Dallas Metroplex. And the reason why we do innovative and new solutions is that, well, Dallas doesn't have a great history of building and developing affordable housing. And when I say Dallas, I don't mean necessarily the city, although the city is a part of it, but Dallas is a community. So the city of Dallas is part of that community, the ISD, DART, uh, private lenders, private developers, nonprofit developers, uh, elected officials, we really haven't done a good job of developing affordable housing here in Dallas. We haven't built enough of it. Much of what we have built uh, is poor quality. And most of the affordable housing that we've built historically has been in uh, certain areas. We've segregated in certain areas of our community, uh, namely Southern Dallas and West Dallas. So when you take a look at that history and you combine it with the development pattern of Dallas throughout the past 70 years, which has been an auto-centric uh, kind of sprawl oriented development, uh, you have some very uh, unfortunate results. So this map up here uh, helps to illustrate how much of your income, a moderate income, a moderate income individual has to pay to live in certain areas of Dallas. Uh, in other words, if you make forty or fifty thousand dollars a year, how much of your income is it going to take for you to live in certain areas of our, of our city? Those areas in the red are the areas where it's going to take more than 75% of your income to live in those areas. 75% or more. So that may be 80%, 90%. If you're making forty dollars or $50,000 a year, you're almost spending your entire income just on housing and transportation costs. Those orange areas are areas where you're spending 50 or 60% of your income, so you're still really struggling. And lastly, those kind of uh, the, the lighter orange, almost yellow areas, uh, that's 30 or 40%. And the really striking thing about this map uh, when you're looking at housing and transportation costs, is it doesn't just re represent a small segment of our population. Uh, the number of households 
in Dallas that earn less than $50,000 a year is half of our households. So this is the map of housing affordability for half of the population of Dallas. And when you have you know, a huge six hundred dollar city where half of the population effectively can't live because of housing and transportation costs, you know, for us at BC, you know, it's very problematic. And so when Aim for Dallas looked at innovative solutions and concepts that we can, that we can implement to tackle housing and transportation costs, we brought an equitable transit-oriented development. Now, transit-oriented development, hopefully most of you are familiar with that concept here, but essentially TODs um, are development that occurs at transitization property uh, where you're really utilizing that transit station uh, to help capitalize on development. Usually they're mixed-use developments. In Mockingbird Station, uh, some areas of downtown Plano are usually cited as good transit-oriented development, TODs. Well, equitable TODs uh, put forward the idea that you don't just need to do mixed use development, but you need to have mixed income development. That you need to get out there and put affordable housing in those locations, at those transit stations, in that development, because that's really capitalizing on the true benefit of that transit. Again, if you're building affordable housing at those stations, you're reducing the housing cost, and if you're allowing individuals to live right there at a transit line to have that access to transportation, you're reducing the transportation cost. And the studies have shown that a household that utilizes public transit as opposed to private automobiles can save up to $9,000 a year. So if you're reducing the housing cost, you're reducing the transportation cost, but in addition, you know, you're, you're also helping out DARP. You know, by putting, by developing those sites, you are generating revenue for DARP, you're increasing ridership by putting potentially thousands of potential riders right here at their doorstep. You're also increasing economic development of those sites. Uh, city has also shown uh, for the citywide uh, level that equitable TODs promote diverse communities and diverse neighborhoods. Again, they promote a lot of economic development for the city, not just for DARP. Um, and, well, if they're designed in a quality manner and designed well, they can also contribute to a, a good public realm and a, a, a much better public space. So at BC, we said equitable TODs seem like they're a great idea. They make a lot of sense, not just for the people, not just for the city, not just for DART. So is this a, a concept that DART's doing? And so we looked at how DART was utilizing the properties surrounding their stations. And with few exceptions, and I won't go into those six exceptions because I think Jack can talk about those far better than I can, but with few exceptions, uh, DART was not utilizing their property for equal TODs, but instead was use, uh, utilizing it for surface parking. And again, there are a number of different uses that you can put next to your train station, uh, but parking is uh, most word increase, not the highest and best use. So with that, we said it makes sense for us to do equitable transit-oriented development. DART isn't doing this in certain locations. We need to dive in and figure out what locations make sense and where we can do it. So with that, I'll uh, hand it off to my colleague, Owen wilson Chavez. Thank you. So I'm Owen wilson Chavez. I'm the Senior Analytics Associate at Building Community Workshop. Um, I work on a team called BC Analytics, and we help nonprofit organizations, community-based or community organizations, and uh, you know we like to help government when, when and where we can um, use data to better inform um, their decision-making processes. Um, so we had this question that came up: How and how might we, you know, take a look at where affordable housing should um, should or could um, be developed across the city? We landed at parking lots of Dart as just kind of an exploration. Where could we look at these? Um, how can we look at these these properties and determine which which stations make sense to um, possibly make sense to develop as affordable housing um, in parking lots and what other goals might be achieved? So in doing our research, we really settled on um, a three pronged approach to kind of narrowing the stations in Dallas. And I um, completely forgot the number of stations in Dallas off the top of my head, um, but. We know that not every station has a context that makes sense for affordable housing. Some don't even have parking lots, and if that's where we're starting, we need to get rid of those from our kind of evaluation at the front. Um, but we also want to look at those that make sense in terms of affordable housing. So we looked at research and we talked to a professor at the University of Kansas, Kirk McClure, who did work for the Department of Housing and Urban Development on opportunity areas. These areas are often low in unemployment, um, are not in areas of concentrated poverty, have access to um, available rent, um, affordable units, and have all sorts of other metrics that make sense for affordable housing. 
So the first thing we wanted to do was look at, part, at stations, DART stations in the city of Dallas that intersect with HUD opportunity areas at the census tract level. Um, then we wanted to look at the potential of these stations in terms of transit rate development and economic development related goals. Um, so they can't just be affordable, you know, serve goals of affordable housing if they're at train stations because that's not the only use. Their use is to help get people onto trains and that has goals related to TOD and economic development. And we also know that we need to do some level of stepping back from the data and looking at site-specific context and information so that we can look at a different range of possible um, affordable housing projects that, that you know, we want we to dream up, look at, and, and have a conversation with. So the first thing we want to do is look at um, these HUD opportunity areas. So here's a map. These, area, these orange areas shown on the map are census tracts in the city of Dallas that score, um, that basically score on the HUD's opportunity index. Um, unfortunately, in Dallas, we don't have as good of a range as the index. These are all relatively, you know, toward the lower end of HUD's index score, which goes from 20 to 80, basically, as opportunity areas. If you get less than a 20, you're not an opportunity area. In Dallas, they range from 20 to 50. Um, so, only a handful of stations fall within, directly fall within a census tract. So, you have Forest Lane, Lake Highlands, White Rock City Place in the northeast side of the city, uh, Walnut Hill, Bachman, Inwood in the northwest, and then Tyler Vernon is the only one south of the Trinity River. Um, you do have a few, like Keast, like, um, which is uh, Royal Lane uh, up in the northwest, which is, I have a laser, which is this one. They fall right at the kind of pretty close to some, to some HUD opportunity areas. Again, these areas are those areas that are relatively low in unemployment, um, have, have good um, access to, an, to a stock of existing um, public housing, um, as well as, or the potential for public housing stock. Um, but they don't necessarily meet the goals of what you might look for when you're looking for a mixed use transit oriented development, or when you're looking to do, you know, stimulate economic development in an area. So then we looked to kind of take this same approach, the same methodology that that Dr. McClure used to develop the Opportunity Index um, and kind of made our own index on um, measuring all the stations against um, criteria for transit area development and economic development. So we looked at things like access to quality schools, um, access to jobs, access to, to different public amenities, so libraries, rec centers, parks, um, as well as looking at you know, access to retail, different types of retail, different types of businesses, um, access to healthcare centers, <coughs> All sorts of different metrics went in, and we created an index that ranked them all on a you know, kind of normalized the ranks, looked at them, and said, "Here's the ones we have best." So we call this our N index. Um, and when we look at the city, the ones that are shown in white, those don't have parking lots or um, any kind of DART-owned land that makes sense to look at. So we kind of eliminate those in the first round. Then we get to an, a second set of those that score really low. They have parking lots, uh, but they don't necessarily meet other criteria of this index. And um, they fall, they get relatively low scores. Then you have this second set that includes like Highlands, Keys, Ledbetter, Hampton, Nathan Corinth, Walnut Hill, Denton. Um, they kind of score in the middle of the range. Um, so they're not the best in all aspects, but they have characteristics that in some cases make sense to look at. Um, and then you have these higher scoring um, census tract, or stations. Um, Royal Lane, Forest Lane, Park Lane, Mockingbird, um, Westmoreland, in addition to some, a few others, they score relatively highly on, on this index that we created. Um, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that tonight. If you want to talk about the data, call me. We'll go have lunch or drink a beer, and I'll talk about data all night, um, way too in detail, and you'll hate me for it. Um, but we really wanted to kind of get to a look at stations and how we might kind of come up with a list of stations that we might finalize. So we landed on this list after a lot of kind of internal debate, reading about stations, reading about the context at stations. So the highest scoring station on our N index was Mockingbird Station. Every iteration of the index we ran, we weighed different criteria differently, Mockingbird came up. Mockingbird was too obvious, so we just said, let's look at other stations. Mockingbird makes too much sense. And then Jack issued an RFP, and we're looking at doing development at Mockingbird already. So. We want to look at other stations. So we also want to get stations in the south. So Westmoreland scored highly on the N index, but um, it wasn't in a HUD opportunity area, but it has a lot, huge parking lot. Um, Thomas will talk, Thomas Simpson will talk a little bit more about that. Um, we want to look at stations in the south, so we had to choose kind of how, how we get there. So MLK Junior Station presents an opportunity. It's near Fair Park. Um, it's in an area that could use you know, some economic development as well, and, and it, it seems to score somewhat well for that. 
Um, and we have all the other stations. So for Forest Lane and Mark, or Inwood Love Field and Market Center, those preserved op opportunities to, to insert pre uh, neighborhood preservation into, the, into what we're looking at. Because we don't think that all sites make sense to look at, at in one way. And we're just trying to, you know, our goal when we were getting to this was how do we identify states, states to then go look at more um, at a site-specific level and take into a site planning approach, you know, a visionary dreaming session, which is where Thomas Simpson, um, a former BCer who was instrumental in this project, will come in and talk a little bit more about some of these sites. Um, and if you have, have any copies of the report floating around, there's a lot more and a lot more detail about these plans. And this report's available on our website as well. So, Thomas. All right, so uh, Patrick laid out some of the basis for this report for you, right? We've, we've got um, available land, we've got a need for affordable housing, and we can check off a couple of different boxes if we think about uh, equitable TOD at these dark parking lots. And then Owen sort of broke down how we selected um, a final few to take a closer look at. So, um, you know, when we were looking at these, one of the ways that we broke these down were Depending on the neighborhood that they were in, each sort of station area um, doesn't necessarily have the same solution, um, nor are they all necessarily the same time frame. So with an emphasis on that sort of opportunity, the HUD opportunity index side of things, uh, wanting to place affordable housing in areas where low-income families can have, um, have higher opportunities and be in better neighborhoods, um, those were sort of the ones that floated to the top as, as uh, immediate immediate idea. So one of the one of the ones that fit this criteria was Inwood Love Field Station. So on the green line uh, up there near Love Field, uh, Dart owns about, and this uh, area outlined in red, it's just under seven acres of land that Dart owns uh, and utilizes as a parking lot here. Um, and you can see in this image some of these uh, new uh, larger multifamily developments that are going on. You can see actually land here that was cleared right across from the station that has a big apartment development going up now. Um, so there's all these development pressures at this site right now, um, higher end luxury apartments. Um, and so it, being in an opportunity area in an area close to jobs, um, it made a lot of sense to start to think about how could we um, apply affordable housing to this area sooner rather than later. Um, the time seemed right. So, um, what we looked at in terms of development here were you sort of have these three bays of parking um, that the site is made up into, into this sort of sawtooth thing. Um, and from just a single one of these bays, if we mimic the development style, say here, um, including two and three bedroom uh, apartments that you know, would be more suitable to low to moderate income families that might have kids, then we could get um, over 100 units of uh, affordable housing development just in a single one of these bays. Um, so, another uh, set of the stations that we thought were a little bit further on, maybe there was more, uh, the neighborhood was not quite uh, in the position where affordable housing would have the same impact um, for the folks that would utilize it, or perhaps there was a more complex conversation that might need to happen with, uh, with the neighborhood. <coughs> they fell into the second category that were slightly uh, further on the horizon in our mindset. So White Rock Station doesn't score as high on the uh, on the economic development and TOD index. It's not as close to jobs, not as close to retail, um, but is in a high opportunity area with low poverty uh, and low unemployment. Um, we also thought that based on the context of the station, uh, there might be a different solution uh, to development at White Rock. So. Um, Directly behind the station here, there's um, single family and duplex development. There's sort of some low intensity condo development here, two and three stories across Northwest Highway. Uh, so we thought uh, this might be a place where you would explore um, actually building home, uh, housing for ownership for low income folks at, the DART, at a DART station. Um, so we were proposing looking at uh, townhome style development here and so the entire White Rock site um, is also just under seven acres that DART owns. And um, we were proposing at about 50% utilization, this parking from day to day, uh, there's no one there. So 
uh, essentially without having to disrupt any of the current parking patterns, you could go ahead and put um, over 60 uh, townhomes at, at a relatively sort of common townhome density just on that portion of the parking lot. Um, and then the last station I want to share with you guys today is uh, Westmoreland Station. Um, Westmoreland, I think, provides uh, a big opportunity that sort of gaps or bridges the gap between more immediate opportunities and sort of longer term opportunities for DART. So the Westmoreland uh, station is the highest scoring Southern Dallas station. Uh, it's the end of the red line. But DART owns um, 11 acres of land, including this portion here that's not used for parking at all, it's just grass. Um, there's a couple acres there that DART owns that, um, you know, we think Westmoreland provides a really interesting opportunity, not just to develop this parking lot, but to shift the conversation and reorient an entire neighborhood scale um, to the transit station. So um, across the street from the station is a grocery store. There's a school uh, in another direction across the street, and it's also surrounded by some of the best public spaces in the city. Um, so how can we utilize the dart owned property to catalyze reorienting a neighborhood to the train station? Um, and just south of uh, the Dardone property, there's um, a very significant swath of land, uh, including low intensity warehouse and sort of light industrial uses, much of which is vacant. Um, that without the freight access that used to be there that would have defined or encouraged that use to begin with, um, that entire swath of land south of the station might also start to be something we can rethink. Um, as part of an urban neighborhood. Uh, there were one other category that were sort of longer range planning that we, that we talked about. So LBJ Skillman Station and um, Bachman Station are both quite large, um, have quite large parking lots that DART owns. LBJ mm -hmm. Skillman DART owns almost 30 acres of land um, uh, and has about 20% parking utilization. So there's tons of unused land there that is publicly owned. Um, but both of those stations are also in areas where there are other public entities that own land and there's also significant infrastructure, some of which is undergoing its own planning. So um, our feeling with those were these are really those are really planning um, projects as opposed to development projects. You know, on the one scale you've got Inwood Love Field, which you know we think if Dart had the development agreement and there was a developer ready, you could go break ground and it would make sense to do it tomorrow. Some of these other stations we think require a little bit more planning. So um, I'm going to wrap up and then pass this, uh, pass this on to our panel, but essentially to, to sort of wrap everything up, DART owned uh, own land or publicly owned land is a great asset that we have. Currently a lot of the land that DART owns is underutilized in the form of surface parking lots. It's not achieving um, as comprehensive of goals as it could if there were development particularly uh, equitable transit-oriented development there. Such a development would help DART through increased ridership and revenue. It would help um, solve some of the affordable housing problems that we have uh, in, this, in Dallas today. And it also, uh, when focusing on high opportunity areas, could really have a big impact, positive impact on uh, the life of the folks that would end up um, being able to take advantage of those opportunities in the future. So the things that, that we've shown here are not necessarily uh, you know, finalized proposed solutions uh, to these challenges. Um, what we're really trying to do is demonstrate the potential that uh, this publicly owned asset has um, to positively impact uh, the future in our city if we, if we only pursue those, those ideas. So um, with that said, I'm gonna pass it to our moderator, uh, Brandon Formey. Um, the first question I have is, so nationally, and these, these numbers are in the report, it, there's a lot of good numbers in the report if y'all haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, so nationally, 25% of households are what's called housing cost burdened. Um, but locally, that's at 37%. So I kind of want to pick y'all's brains on what it is, like what do each of you see as reasons for it being so much higher here than the national average? Sure. Um, well, um, 
Thanks, Brendan, for the introduction. I'm, I'm excited about that, that uh, UTC grant. I uh, look forward to work with all of you and make um, something significant in this region. It's $7.7 .7 million grant uh, over five years' time to study uh, transportation equity and upward mobility, which I think makes a lot of sense to do in DFW. Coming back to, to your question, um, I think there are several reasons um, for that. The, the most important that comes to my mind is the issue of um, location efficiency. So looking at housing as just you know, a single building without the context, without the location, makes a huge um, miss um, representation of representation of affordability. Um, and that's particularly the, the case in Dallas. Um, we we did a study on housing plus transportation affordability, and we found that um, nationwide about. Um, 44% of affordable housing units by HUD are not affordable when you consider transportation costs. That number for Dallas and for DFW for, was 78%, which means we spend billions of dollars on housing and you know housing affordability, but what, what at the end what we get is unaffordability. And the reason is uh, not having access to uh, opportunities, which is one of the you know, great points that is the focus of this report, not having access to uh, efficient transit for those parts that are not affordable, this is what you see, lack of accessibility, lack of location efficiency, um, access to jobs, access to healthcare, access to healthy food, access to you know um, <coughs> higher education quality quality education uh, I mean physical access just not having access means that you have to pay more for transportation and this is interesting to see um, you know we say housing cost is about 30 percent of your household's budget Transportation cost is, is the second highest expenses with 15% on average. We have households in DFW that are spending 35% of their income on transportation, more than housing. And that makes, um, I mean, that's one of the contributors to uh, not having, um, um, uh, you know the same rate of affordability as much as the national average. I believe that's one of the main reasons. Um, uh, but would be yeah, I agree with everything. I agree with everything you just said. I'll just add a couple more points. Um, I think um, you know we we like to boast in Dallas, and I know Dart knows this as well that we've got one of the longest or the longest light rail system in the nation. But it also happens to be in a very sprawl context. So you know, when you talk about location efficiency, we still have a very severe problem of, when you look at the larger context of Dallas, the number of people who live in transit accessible locations is very small. Um, and that's exacerbated by the fact that we have a pretty severe problem in terms of concentrated poverty. We've got parts of Dallas that, that most people who are above a certain income never go to have no reason to go to. There's a lot of disinvestment in those areas. There's no jobs in those areas. And so typically people in those locations have to travel vast distances to get to work. Um, and our roadway systems, our transit systems are just not very friendly for being able to get around it. So that's a very significant factor, I think, in Dallas. That's probably contributed a great deal to, to this issue of the affordability in terms of housing and transportation costs. I do think that um, with the recent recession, there was a marked upturn in that fact, the fact that incomes have not kept pace with increases in housing costs. So I think in the last you know, seven to 10 years, there's been a particular spike in that issue. Well, I agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just, you know, it's, it's 
interesting. Um, I think one of the things in this whole study area really should be just the whole DART service area because right. the suburbs that are part of DART are benefiting and having the same issues. Um, I spoke in favor of an affordable housing project in Plano uh, about six months ago, and usually you think Plano is, oh, they don't have affordable housing. They're tackling the same issues. So um, it was a real cool project. It was aimed at veterans and artists, but it was an affordable housing project, and it was about a half mile away from, not even half mile, um, probably a quarter mile away from the downtown Plano station where they're getting a lot of activity downtown. Um, so, the, so, and I think what the affordable housing issue is that uh, if I need to get a job and I don't have a car, at least the DART service area provides access. As much as folks with certain newspapers like writing these articles about how it takes somebody five hours to get to work by taking the train and the bus and all that, there are many other stories of folks that can get to work real conveniently and real quickly on the system. The other part is uh, a lot, when I did the blue line, I was project manager of the blue line extension uh, many years ago, and the interesting thing is the people that moved to Dallas from out of state that understood the impact of being close to a rail station, and though those folks I think are uh, real, you know, are locating close to the station with the non-affordable housing, so that creates the market and the demand for those types of houses. Uh, you know, when I came here, I was been to the D.C. area before working. I knew get a house close to the rail station. And this is before Mockingbird Station opened up. So I bought a house in the M Streets, and now I'm paying the property taxes for it. So uh, it's the price of homes have just gone up, and so it's sort of that dynamic. Uh, there's a demand for uh, market rate housing for that type of housing near the rail system not necessarily wanting to take the bus, but also many do take the bus. I take the bus now and then. Um, and then others that are just uh, dependent on transit to get to a job, which is really the struggle that we're having. And how do we incorporate that type of a project near the rail stations that can handle and address both market demands as well as affordable housing demands? Why is that a challenge? Because most developers don't want to do affordable housing, um, and because you can't make the numbers work. You know, these guys show all the parking lots, some are, are half full, still those spaces need to get replaced. In order to do that, to come up with a big enough piece of land, number one, you've got to put parking into a structure, which then at sixteen to $20,000 of space, come up to around, you know, six, five, six million dollars as part of it. Uh, at the same time, you're trying to find a way to fund the affordable housing element and, and meet the gap. Uh, and so that's, that's been the push-pull. You know, I just was at a meeting this afternoon, somebody came up to me and asked me about the RFP on Mockingbird that they heard the city was gonna require affordable housing. And if that happens, it's gonna kill it. And so these are some of the issues we gotta deal with. Um, they, and all developers are looking for the incentives that can make up for that. They're, they will put it in if they can f find a way to fund it. Um, one of the things that's made me get a little off track, but the other part of this element, in, 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 which goes along with why develop, developers don't want to do it, is there needs to be education on what affordable housing is. There, everybody jumps to, we need affordable housing, and then right away you get not in my backyard. And in, in the past we've tried to call it workforce housing, well, they figured out that's code for affordable housing now too. Um, so what so, do you call but, affordable housing? Well, affordable housing is what it is, is the 40, 50, 60, 80 percent. Um, but um, you know, the, the, the issue is how to incorporate it um, and make it look, be, because it's, and I'll tell you, it's perception, it's the same perception people had about DART before DART ever was on the ground. You know, they knew it was gonna ruin their property values on down the list, it was unsafe, it was noisy. That, uh, and the same thing with affordable housing. There's a lot of perceptions out there. Some, some have good reason, but the folks I talk to, they think it's, you know, Cabrini Green uh, that's going up in their backyard, these big, huge projects, and they don't want that. Um, they look at a project and 
they you really, if you went to them, they can't tell which has affordable housing in it or not. But they, but in their opinion, they feel it was built to substandard uh, qualifications other than a regular marketplace, market type housing. So that's what I've been running into. It's, it's in the early stages, they don't want to talk about it. And so the city's been real aggressive on its incentives and things. Um, but, and I don't know where you guys are heading with your new housing policy. <laughs> well, um, this is a really interesting time with regard to this issue. There's a confluence of a whole number of reasons why um, there's likely to be a lot of movement on, in terms of policy on, on trying to encourage affordable housing throughout the city at this point in time. Um, there's, of course, the fact that you know, there's nothing like a little bit of a stick to make people to do things. And so the fact that the city of Dallas is under a voluntary compliance agreement with HUD uh, certainly helps. Because given the politics of affordable housing, it's not something that typically developers do voluntarily for the most part. Um, now, it starts becoming easier for developers to do it if it becomes more acceptable to the community. And if the prices become, the cost of providing it becomes more reasonable. So establishing a pretty uniform and predictable policy that applies to everybody in the city can go a long way towards that in terms of reducing risk. And so the city of Dallas is right now in the process of trying to develop policies that cover a whole range of issues. Um, one of them being related to zoning. Uh, there's the issue of so-called voluntary inclusionary zoning. Uh, there are some state restrictions that we have to work within, but the city is actually working towards crafting a proposal for actually introducing the sort of an incentive-based framework for affordable housing to be provided in situations where people are seeking increases in zoning development rights. So that's something that can have some play in this matter because a lot of these stations that were shown on the map, they're all stations that aren't zoned for residential or for that matter zoned for much density. So they would all involve zoning changes. Uh, so that provides an opportunity for some negotiation and discussion about a requirement or a provision for affordable housing at those locations, and that kind of changes the discussion. Um, there's also um, work going on with regard to policies related to actual financial incentives that the city provides through various programs that can help the, the development of these kinds of projects and establishing some expectations of affordable housing provision with them. So a combination of these kinds of programs, usually it takes more than one to make difficult projects like these work, uh, I think will we'll begin to help. Now with all of them, I think Jack referred to this, there's the political aspect that remains challenging. Um, there are all kinds of perceptions associated with affordable housing that are pretty hard to surmount. Um, ultimately, I think it takes um, actually seeing a real development that actually has mixed income and you realize that hey, it's not that different from a lot of other developments for people to begin to change their minds about it. But really getting a few like, uh, projects like that on the ground is what it will take. And in the meantime, the politics of it is always going to be difficult because most people have negative perceptions associated with housing. There's opposition associated with it that raises the cost to developers for doing it. It makes the development process very long and drawn out. Um, the development of dark sites in particular, the two levels of politics that are involved. For the one part, there's a zoning change, and the city council has to approve that zoning change. And there's a lot of opportunity for public input in that context. And then there's also use of dark property, which involves a dark board decision, mm -hmm. which is also a political process. And so both of those have to come together to make projects like these work. Do, you, do the two of you feel like your respective entities, I mean, do you see themselves as, um, you know, needing to be, you know, needing to help reverse the problem? Or do you think it's just something where it's like, the culture is kind of, it's too hard, there's too many, you know, too, too many NIMBYs, too many, you know, appointed or elected officials who don't want to do this, so we just kind of, keep the status quo? I Absolutely not. I think, I, I, going back to what I said earlier, 
there has to be one example of success. And I think if you can get one on the ground, that can be the turning point. Because there's a lot of this, a lot of this has to do with perception. I mean, if you mm -hmm. take the example of Mockingbird Station, when I first came to Dallas in 1999, um, Mockingbird Station was in, 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 in the process of being developed at that point. And there was a lot of negative perceptions about apartments and development, high density mixed development, use. Mm -hmm. mixed use. People had no idea what that meant. Since then, we've come a long way, and it really took actually having some developments like that on the ground to people saying, we want a Mockingbird Station, or we want a West Village. And it's not that long ago that people didn't want any of the stinking apartment developments in their neighborhood. So I, did, I think it takes some examples like that where you can begin to change minds. So I really think it takes getting one or two examples on the ground, and that can begin to turn the tide and change perception. So it's definitely worth worth working on. Yeah, I think you know it depends on the politician and board member or right. whatever. Uh, they've all got their opinions, but I think there's one prevalent opinion which I agree with is in the past these projects have all gone to the same places right. in right. southern Dallas, yeah. and we don't want it anymore. You know, we want good development like Mockingbird Station and all these other developments. And and I agree. And it's sort of how do we get the developers? to go with that at the same time, they're being pushed out, they can make their money doing market rate, yeah. you know, and they can do it faster as long as the zoning's there. So, um, you know, that's, uh, and, you know, be, besides our board, DART's required to get fair market value for our property when we sell it. We can't give anything, we don't, we can't discount the property like the city can through their incentives with cash and things like that. So we're very limited on that. Plus, we're required to go out and compete. So if a developer comes in and says, I'm the guy who's going to do affordable housing here, we still have to put it out on the streets and let everybody come in and compete for it. And we're looking, we have to get fair market value and our board is looking for community benefit, for ridership, uh, what would the ridership that comes out of it be, but also revenue. And we're looking to uh, initiate uh, long-term revenue streams. So by doing long-term leases on these properties and not selling them. So, but I think one of the big things is, is that they always come up to the gap and, and part of it is, which I've talked about in the past, I had a friend at Federal Reserve who talked about, you know, they have the community um, reinvestment zone. Why not get the Federal Reserve to push on parking? Because every, every developer says it's the lender making them do it. Uh, and structured parking is what's driving up the cost. And these structures have many more parking spaces that are needed whether it's a shared lot or just a lot for the, mm -hmm. for the uh, parking. I wish Paris would have been here. I think he's got numbers that show that those garages don't need to be built that big. But it's not the city that's requiring it. It's, it's the lender or developer. Or, or the lender will say, well, if the developer wants to you know, come up and show us how the numbers work and make a case for it, well, that'll take two months. They don't have time to do that. That costs money. For them, they just go ahead and build it. And so when you're talking $6 million for a parking structure, that's coming out of that narrow gap that at the city can't make up for. So, although, and one other, one other, get, you talk about incentives. Pierre and I are carrot and stick people. He's <laughs> carrot and I'm stick. I heard the other day that, <laughs> that a carrot is just a stick painted orange. <laughs> <laughs> Which even, even around you know, rail stations, lenders still want a oh, lot of parking spaces? Yeah, particularly in Dallas. Well, I'd, I'd say in, in the South, okay. in general. It, we have this discussion at Council of Governments, and Travis is here, I think. Uh, they just got a grant, and that's one of the things we're going to look at, is disproving the case that we need all these parking cases. Um, right. it's, I've been be beating my head on this for all 25 years that I've been at DART. That yeah, we don't I mean, doesn't that, that perpetuate the, the cycle of car dependence? Sure, yeah. And, you know, and, and just like with the idea of getting one good project in that you can prove it, getting one project in that doesn't have all the parking that everybody needs, it's just we don't need parking downtown, but everybody's talking about we need more parking downtown. And it's just that drum roll keeps going. And so we've talked in the past, too, of trying to build maybe a... Uh, parking district where the district builds a garage 
whether it's with TIF funds or something like that, and then the uses around it could be shared along with DART. Because DART's peak is just morning and afternoon. You know, you look at uh, Mockingbird Station, it's a great example. And we just did another parking study on it for this RFP, and it, it proves it up again. It's about 70% of the parking in the evening is going over to the Mockingbird Station project over to the retail. And then we've also got some poaching by the apartments around there. You know, for some reason, folks like parking on surface lots too, instead of going into a garage. But um, it's how do we change that perception and that attitude? And yeah, you go out to the West Coast, that's, you know, they're reducing parking all over the place. They're building projects that don't have any parking. Um, but so, we're definitely not the West Coast. So. Yeah, I mean, so there, there's, it's not really that comparable to some of the East Coast and West Coast cities. I think the reality is, you know, I mentioned earlier on that we are in a pretty sprawl city. So when you think about people's typical daily needs, it is still pretty hard to manage without a car unless you're particularly passionate about living an alternative lifestyle. Uh, for most people who are not that passionate, it's pretty easy to get into that rhythm of being car dependent. Um, we have little pockets of areas within the city where you have the potential to be non-car dependent if you choose to. Uh, they're pretty limited. Um, but in a region like ours where, you know, any given month of the year, you're, who knows where you're going to need to go on any given day, uh, you tend to be fairly car dependent. So I think we're still some ways away from being able to really make huge changes in the way travel patterns occur. We've got lots more to do in terms of infrastructure investment to really support alternative modes. So in the meantime, it's fairly understandable that you're not going to expect dramatic reductions in parking in most sites, but there's still a lot of room for economizing on parking. In places like downtown, we've had like for decades now pretty low parking requirements. Most developments build way more than the city requires. So it's not about regulation, it's really more about market demand. You've been shaking your head a lot, Trent. Been talking about parking. Did you want to jump uh, in? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I want to mention a <coughs> national study. I was part of a team on a national study on parking generation for TOD sites. And we covered about, I think, 10 cities in the U.S., pretty diverse from all around the U.S., and, and, um, and, and look at the, the number of parking demand and parking generation for TOD sites versus other types of mixed-use developments and other types of developments. And, and what we found was that just being in a TOD site makes a huge difference. The number of parking that is required is considerably you know, lower than other types of mixed-use development. Um, and this is, as um, Peter and Jack mentioned, is just a perception. Uh, when you study, you see that, you know, you do a quantitative study, you see that, no, those parking areas are not really necessary. They could be turned into something that, you know, makes the area, you know, viable even to housing or other types of developments. But it's just the general perception that, you know, we, we, we still are dealing with. Um, the other thing I want, I want to mention about the, the sprawling pattern of this region, this is another thing that is, is um, you know, I've been studying for a while um, nationally. And um, as you would know, Dallas Sports Force, DFW, is one of the most sprawling regions in the country. And um, I think we ranked all metropolitan areas in the US, and Dallas was pretty much on the bottom uh, yeah. of the list in terms of sprawling. And uh, I think. Um, Having policies that encourage um, infill development, uh, particularly toward making strong sub centers or centers. So uh, 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 I always think, you know, um, maybe one way to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, m make more efficient um, way of. Um, having our transit system and, and, and our, our, our transportation system is to have strong sub centers that are connected together with an efficient transit system. And then you know that instead of just being dispersed all around the region, 
you have concentration of activities, jobs and housing on, on, on those sub centers that you know could be connected with transit. And that would be, um, I, 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 uh, Jack and Peter, please correct me, I don't think the uh, coverage or the length of our trans, trans, public transit system is a problem. Indeed, we have one of the longest transit systems, light rail systems in the country. But I think the problem is the land uses around these transit stations. Those needs to be, uh, you know, uh, planned in a more, in, in a smarter way to again uh, be planned toward making a stronger uh, sub center system that work with really this trans, trans, transit system. So it's land use and transportation together that would make our transit system more efficient. I actually think that uh, the, the fact that we, between DART and the city, we've invested in a light rail transit system that pretty much covers, it's, it's a pretty good system in terms of a radio uh, coverage over the city, and it's a vastly underutilized infrastructure investment right now. Um, you're very right that the, the, there hasn't been enough development to actually take advantage of that. Uh, and it's something that's been the case now for quite a long time. Uh, we've got probably at least a couple of decades or so of um, having had that infrastructure in place, but relatively few examples of it actually resulting in increased density. And it's a, it's a combination of a number of factors. One has something to do with the fact that many of them actually pass through areas that are zoned single family and that are very unlikely to significantly increase in density. Uh, and then the other has something to do with uh, them being in areas that are, say, that largely industrial, and so there's a longer cycle of change involved in, in creating those developments. But we still, that said, we've got a huge, vast, untapped potential um, that um, if you sort of keep a really long-range view in mind, we've got tremendous potential for growth to actually create that vision of a sort of a multi-centric city, city that's connected by transit. Mm -hmm. Has DART looked at the report, and I mean, just taking like two of the examples that they identified, the, the Inwood and the, the Forest stations, I mean, do y'all see those as, as oh, we, viable for affordable housing? Westmoreland, we've talked to, I don't know how many developers over the years, that uh, there was one as late as last, uh, a year ago, October, uh, dropped, he dropped out then, and, and he did TOD down in Houston. Um, basically, he, he couldn't make the numbers work. And, and that was around our site, it wasn't on our property, but he wanted to do that as a phase two or three. Um, some of the other sites, like uh, White Rock Station, uh, I told Patrick and Owen, good luck with that neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> um, because uh, I was chewed new ones periodically when I did the blue line up through that neighborhood. And that's part of it is, when we talk about the land use around station areas, the alignments aren't the perfect alignments. The stations aren't, weren't all selected as this is the prime spot. Because back then, and I can, and I can speak because I was there, is you know, we had to go where we could. We had promised a rail system. We needed to get it in and get it built. And the cities controlled, particularly then when it was the starter system, the city of Dallas controlled where the stations were going where the alignments were going. And a lot of times it was the path of least resistance. Um, and at the same time, when the stations were being constructed and open, there were still land use decisions that were stupid. You know, look at Lover's Lane Station. That was built while the train was under construction. That little strip center with Office Max, uh, Office Depot, one of those, and the post office, that's not transit oriented at all. Now, and then, you know, how do you get it out of there? The, uh, um, my last axe out of will grind, Victory Station. <laughs> How that got put there was not DART's decision. DART had a place for it uh, right in the middle of all the development. And it was not our decision where it got put. So, and then you know, later on, then we get people coming in, well, why is the station right over there? So a lot of these are points in time, you know, it's easy. Uh, to say this is the, the easiest route to go, but, and, and being political, uh, you know, all, all of these alignments, this is Parkland Station, yeah, you can go down the list, 
if we, we've joked in the office, we should, staff should come up with a map of where the system really should have gone according to staff, <laughs> <laughs> and where the station should have been. Um, but, you know, it, it's just the reality, and it's not just City of Dallas, it's in the suburbs, it was very new. Uh, they knew nobody was gonna use it, uh, except those people. And so, uh, you know, nobody expected, and particularly the developers, never expected the system to really take off like it did and be popular for development. And so we're, as Pierce said, we're just in the early, we are a very new system in the scheme of things. And so folks talk about it like, you know, we've had these years and years and years and look at, you know, what a disaster. But, you know, this is a very successful system. A lot of other cities in the United States wish their systems were as successful as this because the amount of time, and we still have the ability to go in and make uh, zoning changes. I think, uh, lastly, the, the, uh, I think the one thing which gets back to perception too is the affordable housing element really needs to be part of a mixed use project. It can't be the only project because it, it, you know, it'll never go with that. But if it's part of a project, and, that, and that's the issue of, you know, the folks don't understand that when there's a for, affordable housing element in an apartment project, that they don't designate this, this apartment, this one, and this one are affordable, and therefore we're not gonna build them as well as the rest. You know, there, it's any apartment in when it's open, as long as they get their percentage in. And so it's not a different type product. So I think that's, you put that together, and I think it's a much easier sell. And you know, I don't know if you guys have an opinion on it, but I just think if you do a standalone, like townhomes or standalone uh, apartments and say this is an affordable project, you, you're just gonna get hammered. Well, the only thing I'll add to that is I think the context is really important and the need to try to blend in to some extent to the, the surrounding character makes a big difference. Clearly the idea of trying to, to foster mixed income as the way to go so that people don't sort of associate a development with a certain type of income group um, because that's part of the problem. The idea of trying to encourage the idea that you shouldn't be able to really tell the difference from walking by an area where there's sort of low income or not a low income area. And you do find lots of examples in, in this country in different cities where you have neighborhoods that have a lot of mix of income and you really can't tell. You know. mm -hmm. uh, take some time to get there. One mm -hmm. other point I just wanted to make was, you know, we do have some examples of success, success stories of this sort of idea uh, but they have not typically been in so-called high opportunity areas. Mm -hmm. You know, Paris is not here, but mm -hmm. the Lancaster Urban Village is a great example on a transit corridor. Uh, the Hall Project near South Dallas Tech Park. But those are all areas that you couldn't characterize as high opportunity. The real challenge is to, you know, if you could do it at Mockingbird Station or Lover's Lane, and there it's really a numbers problem. So how do you make it work and who pays for the gap and, and all of that? And I think one thing too is don't miss out on seniors housing. That's a there is a big demand for seniors housing out there. Right. And so how do we integrate that too? So what questions do y'all have? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for coming out here. Uh, you sh sounds like you're trying to make uh, Dallas more like Chicago, downtown, down, um, Washington D.C., and New York. John, so <laughs> and it's going to be interesting where we try to build upon it. You know we have a serious problem in Dallas. Homeless, low income people, they don't want to go into trade and get jobs because they need affordable housing. How many percentage of those buildings are going to be for low income? How many are going to be for those who make six figures? And parking, you know, we test a lot about parking. You have big carrots and you have a big ramp. Can you use that for a parking area so that people who want to use the transit system can still park their car and use part of their commute to transit and park their, their car? So that's what they're doing everywhere, everywhere else in the state. So, can you please tell me how So, um, there, are, there are a number of ways in which the city could try to incentivize development uh, that, that, that provides for affordable housing. And I mentioned earlier that we are working on trying to craft a policy to encourage a range of income groups to which affordable housing is provided for. Um, you know, the, the normal definition for affordable housing is usually 80% or below of the area median income. And 
typically we've had for some years of policy towards requiring them in our in some of our incentive programs and it really requires providing affordable housing for the 80 percent or below level and typically what happens is because it's the most financially viable developers provide it only at the 80 percent level they don't provide it below that level at all so it tends to get skewed towards the upper end of that income spectrum so we are right now wrestling with that problem and figuring out how to create an incentive program where you can create more of a range so that some of the lower income levels are also catered to and that it actually makes financial sense for the developer so that you know maybe if you provide more at the lower end you, you need to provide fewer so that it can actually make more more sense so you get a better mix and a better balance i would say tagging on to that question um, we talk a lot in oakcliffe about the median area income that's used is at the metro area Right. where it's about 49,000 and in Oak Cliff the median income is more like 24,000 so 80% of 24,000 would be awesome but that's not the requirement so it's like you yeah. get people making a lot more money um, than the folks in that neighborhood could afford so I, I'm glad you guys are looking into that now that we also have the trolley in Oak Cliff and people are starting to think of trolley as transportation too. That that changes the dynamic that you can live in Bishop Arts if you could afford one of those new apartments that are going in, one of the hundreds of new apartments going in. You could, you have direct access to downtown, and that really increases your opportunity for job access. Um, whereas Dart is still two miles south of Bishop Arts, so it's really not um, like a dark, accessible kind of location, but it, it, yeah, starting to look at those equations differently is important. Yeah. I think part of uh, the, the success of a TOD, for instance, at Mockingbird Station, is they, these are places that you can use seven days a week, whereas if you look at the infrastructure right now for DART, and also uh, the development as far as where the income is, um, it doesn't allow for it to be used seven, uh, seven days a week. Right now, when you guys have admitted to this, that um, all of the lines lead to the Central Business District downtown. And so there's no intent for someone at LBJ station to get to Westmoreland station necessarily. There's, there's no reason for them to go across there. So have you guys looked at going east to west with the system? There's been talk about it, but uh, even, even the DC system is just starting to do that, and they've opened in 73. So. Um, that's still a long way out. First, getting in the, the spine. It, back in 95, um, if you can remember back that far, I can. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I was doing the system plan update, and we had all kinds of public meetings, and everybody was coming in complaining, and this is when we just had a bus system, that any trip I took, if I was in Irving and wanted to go to Garland, I had to go downtown. If I did that, you know, anything I did, there was no north, south, east, west access. It all was a radial system. So the, the train was put in to replace the radial system. So that's why you see now the buses feed into the stations, and we do much more east, west, north, south, and feeding into the stations. And if you want to go downtown, um, say from Mockingbird or Richardson, you can get on the train. Or, but if you're in Richardson and want to go to Addison, you can take the bus. So um, it, it's still constantly being worked at on uh, improving the system. But you know, this is, again, this is an early system. We're, we're just new to this, uh, uh, just 20 years of operations. So, uh, but we've got a long ways to go. The other is, you know, we've sort of touched on too, Dallas was built within a highway system. You know, it, it's not like the cities on the East Coast that were all built before there was cars. And they, so they didn't build around an interstate highway system. We're sort of infilling the interstate highway that was built around Dallas. And so now we're, as I've told other folks, it seems like we're backfilling in with a transit system to try to fill in into a roadway system that's not really conducive to a transit system. Still have a lot of cul-de-sacs, a lot of roads that go different ways. So. Um, so we're trying to, to handle that as best we can, too, given the infrastructure that we've got. Can, can I have a follow-up um, Now, I remember 95, because I know you guys got a lot of resistance mm -hmm. as far as taking the buses, not bringing them downtown. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There was a lot of resistance there. 
I guess what my point is is that on the when it comes to the weekend, I, I'm an avid train rider. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to the weekend, whenever I want to get to, if I'm going from LBJ Skillman to Royal Lane, mm-hmm. that's an hour train. Oh yeah, yeah. Instead of you know maybe two stations going two stations east west. Mm-hmm. Well, that's and I promised myself I wasn't going to get into these areas, but that's the cotton belt. <laughs> So, and that's all I'm saying about it. Three or four more questions? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick note. So, um, right, it's not just coastal cities that are developing parking lots along their transit system. Um, I was aware that Atlanta was doing this at MARTA on their parking lots. Um, and they were sort of spearheading this. and. Just did a quick search, and three weeks ago they broke ground on their first development on a seven-acre MARTA parking lot. That's 330 <coughs> uh, MARTA units and 95 affordable senior units. So it's something that can be done in cities that are. Used a to a Dallas work. architectural firm, JHP, worked at this one I'm thinking of worked on it. But they, you know, MARTA's been around a long time. They've been at this for a long time, and they haven't had a lot of success on the money side of it, and so. But uh, they're starting to make some headway now, too. So I know folks in all these agencies. Absolutely. That's the downside of being around for 25 years. So. <laughs> I'm just hoping that maybe that can provide a blueprint for mm-hmm. how we can help make some of this possible. Uh, one thing that I'm curious to learn more about is um, is to what extent DART, what, are, what exactly are the legal constraints that, um, that prevent DART from um, from offering sort of value incentives to developers, yeah. using that as an as the land as an asset um, to encourage affordability, in particular because we know that ridership has a value to DART, and 90% of people that use public transportation in the city of Dallas make $50,000 a year or less. So the people that need the affordable housing are also the people that are going to be riders, which mm-hmm. is a revenue stream. Um, and one of the things that I'm just curious about, um, because I know that DISD has some restrictions similar to what you said that that they have a requirement to um, if, if they're offering doing a, a public offering of, of land that they have to get a fair market value for it but I know that there is some loopholes there where they can work um, with the city I believe if they're not offering it to a private entity first that allows them some flexibility in that valuation process but I, I'm just curious well, if you can tell if me it's more given, about If it's selling land to the city um, without going through and offering, the land has to stay as a public use. It can't be, we've, appro- we've tried this, I won't go into detail, but we tried to do this one time. And the city attorney came in and said, no, here's a uh, attorney general's opinion on why you can't this do one? it. No, no, it was before. <laughs> it was art. <laughs> um, but no, you, that you can't do it. We're required there in our enabling legislation. Uh, we, as our CFO constantly reminds me, we are not allowed. We don't have any economic development incentives, any of that in there. So have we're required to go. Has there been any talk about trying to change that? Trying to change the state law? Um, there's been talk, but that's you know when we can't even raise the sales tax to get non-member cities to end, that's, that's further down the list. But Is that just for, for selling land or is that for leasing as well? Selling, leasing, anything. We, have, we are required by both Federal Transit Administration, if there's federal money involved, and by the state to get fair market value and, and to go through a bid process. So um, I forgot what your first question was, but... but uh, it, was, it was about... Um, yeah, what, what, uh, what are the legal constraints that are there? Yeah. One of our attorneys has put that. it this way, it's called gifting and we're not allowed to gift. We can't give anything away. We can't give it at a discount, it, it's public money. So we are required to get the fair market value for that. And so that's, that's where the city has the abilities, TIF districts are the big ones, and some of their own other programs where they're allowed to do that. And so and that's where we've looked to partner with them when we can. Um, you know, the, the city, it, uh, like with the RFP coming up, the city is part of our team that will review and select a developer. And we, we're going to be weighing all the uses that they're proposing and, and in future. Uh, we also did, we partnered 
in 2013 on Buckner Station. We used the um, HUD Challenge Grant, some of that money, uh, to uh, go out for a solicitation for a project on that property. About 50% of the parking on that lot um, was being, is being utilized. And we only had one response. Um, and that one never materialized. Uh, part of it was putting a parking garage in on it. You just couldn't make the numbers work. Any other questions? I hope everybody's not depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I had one, but you stole mine. I saw that land. <laughs> <laughs> that project, so. mm -hmm. so, is it hard allowed to um, bring the land of a partner with the developer? Uh, partnership refers legal liability, so, so uh, we try not to say partner. Uh, 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 Federal Reserve always says collaborate, they never say partner. So, <laughs> but we put it out there with developers but, uh, as a possibility in their RFP, uh, if there's a way that we can come up. have to acquire the land, then the numbers might be a little bit more. Easy well, to you don't have to. Well, the thing is, what we're looking to do is to lease the land to them. So that and that stretches the payments out over a long time. So and we're willing to work on that. We've we propose it. Well, developers have come around on leasing land. You know, five ten years ago, they were dead set against it. Uh, and you go to you go to other other big cities, and they do it all the time. So it's just. Some things are different here in the Dallas area. We're still learning as we go, but um, now that the the other is um, where Atlanta's been very successful is when they have a capital event, when the property sells from one developer to the next one, which is something that happens quite a bit, particularly in the Dallas area where I build the apartment project, hold it for a year, and then sell it the next year. Um, they get a percentage off of that sale. And that's where they, besides their, their base lease term, so they've come up with that. So there's, there's some things we're really looking to be, whatever we can do that's innovative to make these projects happen, but um, we got to stay within the law. So. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. Oh, Patrick. One, I just have one question for, for Pierre. So, you know, Dex talked about how DART has certain limitations about what they can and can't do. Do you foresee the ability for the city to be the stick and the carrot as well to say you know, we can initiate zoning change on these properties where we're going to require affordable housing. So in a situation like Mockingbird, any developer walking in has to do affordable housing. So it's highly desirable. The land's worth a lot of money. They're going to make a whole bunch of money building luxury condos on 80 percent. Can the city make that requirement? Say with 20 or 30 percent has to be affordable. So the city does have to operate within certain constraints that the state has imposed upon us with regard to inclusionary zoning. Yeah. So that is a that's a that's a challenge. Um, so we can't require it. In other words, you can't like leave no other option other than to build affordable housing. But you could, I, I guess, what we are exploring right now as we are trying to develop our version of what we're calling a voluntary inclusionary zoning ordinance is how do you turn that into an incentive so that you can make it worth people's while, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if they are seeking a development right that they don't already have. Right. Um, and how, you know, to what extent can you attach a value to that and, and assume that there's some way in which you can have a proportional relationship between that ad additional value that they're asking for through zoning and some expectation that they, they provide um, affordable housing to earn that additional value. So that's the line of thinking we are, we are approaching, but just straight out inclusionary zoning does not appear to be an option. For so us. no even like deed restrictions on the property in order to, we use deed restrictors, you know, talk about senior housing, possibly there's deed restrictors that are intended for affordable housing for senior housing. Well, there has to be some, the, the key language being that it has to be incentivized as opposed yeah. to required. So whatever way you can do that, I presume, falls within the realm of possibility. Um, you know, even in terms of you know, providing money, like when we use our TIF funding to give a developer money, sure, we can ask them to provide affordable housing in return. That's all fine, but 
just rezoning and saying you shall now provide affordable housing. Doesn't look like it's possible. For I have a related question. Um, has the city and BART looked together at redesigning some of the stations to be more pedestrian friendly and like create more pedestrian access to the neighborhoods? Um, for example, I used to um, live up near the Arapahoe station and I always remember noticing how difficult it would be for me to walk there. And I was just like, well, well, good thing I always drive. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I really lived close enough to walk, but it made me curious. Is that something that we're looking at? It, it's something that we've, we've looked at for a long time. The real challenge is discipline and focused infrastructure investment, mm -hmm. which is typically a council decision. And typically, on our track record in terms of how investment occurs with, with infrastructure, it is rarely concentrated, targeted, or strategic. It tends to be spread around. And I imagine that's a lower priority than fixing roads. So. Fixing roads, <laughs> potholes, absolutely. Um, there are relatively few areas where people are clamoring for sidewalks, lots of places where people are clamoring for potholes being fixed. So it goes back to, you know, by and large, there's a lot more people driving than there are walking. And so they have a lot of voice. Yeah, at what point mm -hmm. does that parent turn into a stick? <laughs> <Right>. So, <laughs> stick <turned> into <laughs> when you paint it orange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> orange. So there are some areas where I think the city has been more successful. So particularly in areas where we have tips, and you know some, something about that, there's a little bit more ability to to force a more concentrated or a strategic approach to putting in sidewalks more consistently. Uh, you know, so it's. I take an extreme example like uh, it's not transit oriented necessarily, but State Thomas that was largely completely built up as a result of a TIF district. You have pretty consistent sidewalks everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, but those are pretty rare. Uh, otherwise, development tends to be piecemeal. So even in most of our TIF districts, wherever there's a TIF funded project, you'll have great sidewalks, and then it'll lead nowhere to a project next door that's been lying fallow for the last ten years. So the 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 trouble with sidewalks is the vast majority of sidewalks in the city of Dallas get built by private developers as part of the private development process. I'd say over 90% of our sidewalks get built that way. Uh, simply because it would take too much, too large a chunk of our of our capital funding to actually make a real significant dent on on our sidewalks in Dallas. An intersection. That's right. So, yeah, you know, it's possible for us to, through a set of logical criteria, identify which are the places that putting in sidewalks would make the most sense. The challenge is that they will probably be in one or two council districts, and so <laughs> to get the entire council to vote for that will probably be challenging. So you get all bureaucratic on you. Um, our interlocal agreement back in, which was done back in the 80s with the city, we were required to do everything on, on our sites, and we didn't do anything off-site. That was the city's responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that's why you'll see a sidewalk go up and then end as soon as you get off our property, and then become dirt or something else. So that's what, when we designed the stations, we tried to anticipate where good pedestrian access would be. You'll see a lot of them have spines down the middle that lead people into the platform, into the center, that come from the parking lots. So a lot of them were designed for the future, and not just for sidewalks from the city, but by future development also. So those are the things we're looking for now. And, and also, you know, we're, and I think uh, Councilman Kingston was great on it. We had a project at um, uh, Lover's Lane Station. About 100 feet as the crow flies, there is a site that was being proposed as mini story and went right through plan commission. I'd post, I think I copied you on the email to mm -hmm. uh, Council knows. I think he got those. Um, but we opposed, DART opposed those. We actively, we get all the zoning cases and we, re, we look at them and we'll, if we have questions, we'll fire them out just to make sure that it's a good use though. Some of the mini, mini storage has gotta be the worst thing to put near a rail station. And <laughs> Councilman <laughs> Kingston actually opposed it at, at uh, Council. And turned it down and one of the reasons was well there's no way to get this well there's no sidewalk there right now and that developer could have put one in so um, but we're always monitoring and it's not just city of Dallas uh, all the all the cities Plano Richardson Carrollton um, Farmers Branch 
Uh, we're working with all of them uh, on all these issues. You just got to sort of be observant. Well, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you all for